Uh, continuing in this, uh, this series, Spiritual Plagiarism, uh, today we're looking at karma. And so every person has done some bad things in their life, right? Everybody here has done some bad things in their life. Uh, and, and for those bad things, uh, we've had some consequences. We've had some things that have happened as a result of the bad things that we have done. But you could go the other way with that too, and no matter how bad a person uh, really is, they've probably done some good things in their life. Now, you may be thinking of somebody right now, and you're like, that guy's never done anything good. I know it. I you know. I believe me. Trust me. But at some point, he probably held the door open for a mom that had her hands full with little kids or told his grandma thanks for the cookies. There's probably somewhere, sometime, he did something kind, something nice to somebody. And so even he probably received some kind of positive consequences for that with a thank you or a hug or a, a smile or something. But when we think about our lives, right, there are, are many people that believe that in your life you ultimately have to have a balance to those things. You have to have a balance of the good things with the bad things like the old set of scales, right, where you put stuff on each side and you kind of weigh it out. And, and, and if you don't know this, this is how they would weigh things in the Bible days, when it talks about uh, ripping people off and, and things not weighing what they should be, it could be like you go to get you know a certain amount of, of barley and they'd have the scale off, so they weigh it with a you know say a half pound gold bar on one side or half pound or whatever, and put the barley on the other. And a lot of times they would mess those scales up to where you weren't getting what you thought you were getting. But if you picture that kind of scale. If you look at everything good going on one side and everything bad going on the other side, many people think that at the end of the day, you kind of have to end that day with it being balanced. And our, our world and the Buddhist religion would call this karma. But karma says that all people do bad things. This might be something you don't know. You might just think karma is that balance of good and bad. But karma says that all people do bad things. And in that sense, in that single statement, it's right. All people do bad things, but it says that those bad things cause suffering, and since no one wants to suffer, to undo the suffering of the bad deeds, we've got to do good deeds to balance it out in our lives. It's this idea of what goes around and comes around. It's this idea of that you will ultimately get what you deserve, whether good or bad, and to a degree this sounds like it could be a biblical Theology. It could be something that sounds good, but, but when you think about karma in this way, the problem with karma is you, right? The problem with karma is you. This belief that, that if you do more good than bad at the end of the day, see, they take it a little bit farther, and it, it means that you will be something better or worse in the next life. If you believe in karma, you also believe in reincarnation. You also believe that if you were good, you'll be something better next time. If you were bad, you'll be something worse next time. That's not true. This is spiritual plagiarism because the Bible tells us that it was appointed for each man to die. How many times? Once. Hebrews 9, 27. And it's appointed for men to die once. But after this is what? The judgment. After this is the judgment. It's not about doing more good or more bad and getting a better life or a worse life. It's about when you die at the end of this life, it is time for the judgment. This right here, church, this is our one shot. This is all we get. You die and then you are judged. And if you're judged for your works, I can promise each and every one of us, myself included, that the scale will not show in our favor. It will not be like, you know, well, you know, actually he was a pretty good guy. Just barely made it, you know, just by a, you know, a quarter of an ounce that he's in there. No, it's not going to show in your favor at the end of the day if you are judged for your works. And you will receive the consequences of those works, which will be death, eternal death and hell. It's a fact. But let's read the next verse in Hebrews chapter 20 or chapter 9, verse 28. It says, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear for a second time 
apart from sin for salvation. Church, this is your shot right here, right now, today. Salvation in Christ alone by the work that he did on the cross alone. If you receive him as Lord and Savior in this life, the Bible says that you are born again. Not born again because you did more good than bad, but born again because of what Jesus did on the cross, because he is God, because he is completely good, because he died on the cross and paid that penalty for our sin, offers us a new life that is in him. And in this new life, we receive his righteousness. Some may say his righteousness. This is important, and I'm trying to get through this part of the, of the karma because it is important, but it's not where the bulk of it's going to be. It means that in that day, if you were to see a set of scales, it's going to have your bad deeds on one side, which is going to be very heavy and very weighty. And if you put your good deeds on the other side, you're going to lose. But if you put his righteousness on that side, that's how the scale tips in your favor, so to speak. Because nothing can outweigh the righteousness of Christ. Amen? And so this is what we have in Christ Jesus. When we're judged on that day, it will not be by our works, but by his sacrifice. So the question is, have you received Jesus? Have you given your life to the only one who can save your soul? Because if you haven't, today is the day. Make the choice. But now until Jesus returns, we have to live life on this earth. Last night, as we went to my mom's to play, uh, play cards, and she had brought back Portillo's Italian beef and some Portillo's chocolate cake, and I was like, this is it. I could die today, tonight. Like, die tonight, Jesus come back tonight, whatever, I'm good to go after this. But we got a life to live on this earth. We're here for a reason, amen? amen. We're not just here waiting for the clock to keep ticking, just waiting for that final moment, that final minute. We're here for a reason, and we still have good to do, and unfortunately, we still have some bad that we probably will do. And if you take this lie of the enemy, if you think about this lie of the enemy with karma, and if you remove the reincarnation, if you like, I don't believe that. We just looked at it biblically. That that doesn't. That's not a part of it. But I still kind of believe the what goes around comes around. I still kind of believe the uh, uh, you know you get what you deserve. It still makes sense to. A degree it does seem biblical but here's 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 the thing karma is a lie from the devil and I'm just gonna tell you that karma has no place coming from the lips of a Christian of a believer in Christ no place not you're, you're buying into an ideology of the devil okay now I'm gonna look at today we're gonna look at what is this ripped off from? Because this is spiritual plagiarism. It's something that the enemy has taken from the Lord, from his word, twisted it and changed it, repackaged it as something that is almost right. It's, it's pretty close. Like, like to, the, to the normal person, it seems good, right? The word says there's a lot of things that seem good to men, right? But at the end, the result is death. Okay, there's a lot of things that seem good. It's not about does it seem good because it's just enough wrong that those who live by it will go to hell. It's just enough wrong because, again, you, then you're back under the law. Now, now you're going on the scale of have I done enough good or is the bad going to outweigh it? So what does the Bible say? There's a spiritual law we're going to look at today. It's in Galatians chapter 6. And it goes like this. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. He says, do not be deceived. This is my 
very regular reminder that when we read an epistle that these are written to who? The church. They are written to believers. Paul is writing to a church and he's saying, listen, don't be deceived. So what is he saying? He's saying that it is possible that you could be deceived. He's saying it is possible that you could be led astray. Why? Because some of this stuff is close. It's close to right, but it's just enough wrong that if you follow it for the rest of your life, it will lead you to hell. And this is what karma is. It says that God is not mocked. See, when it talks about mocking God, it, it literally means to turn your nose up at God. And it says that God is not mocked. You can question his word. You can doubt what he says. But at the end of the day, his word will prove to be faithful and true. Amen? It will prove it. And the thing is, what he says will happen, will happen. So do not be deceived, for God is not mocked. Then it says, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. This is more than a promise. This is a spiritual law. It's something that God put into effect. It's in here more than this. It's in the Psalms. It's in the Old Testament. It's in uh, 1 Corinthians. It's in here many times about sowing and reaping. It's a spiritual law, okay? So when you think about sowing and reaping or planting and picking, okay, if that might be better terminology for you, planting and picking, when you think about this, if you plant an apple tree, you will not go out to it one day and all of a sudden it's producing oranges, right? Because you will pick what you plant. Why is that? There's, there's an important thing about sowing and reaping. The important thing is, what is the seed? What is the seed? What is the source? What is the beginning? What is at the root of what you are doing? You realize that every plant comes from a seed. If you go out here to Carver's Produce here in, in a couple months, and you go out there and you buy your tomato plants, guess what? That did not start out as a tomato plant. I know for somebody in here, this is mind-blowing right now. You're like, I just go and buy a tomato plant. I put it in the ground and it makes tomatoes. Well, CW takes those seeds and puts them in the soil, and he does all kinds of other stuff to get that seed to a place where it produces a plant. Then you put that plant in the ground, and you do some things to it, and eventually it will produce the fruit. It will produce whatever it is that you are wanting. Okay, so... When you think about the seed, it's all about the seed. A tomato seed will ultimately give you what? Tomatoes. Squash seeds will ultimately give you what? Corn seeds will ultimately give you what? Bird seed will ultimately give you what? Birds. Yeah. No, if you plant bird seed in the ground, it will not produce birds. But if you put it out, it will, it will gather some birds for you. But when you think about this seed, the seed is important. The seed that you sow, whatever you're doing with your life, whatever actions you take, whatever words you say, with everything you do, it's important because you are sowing. Something is going to come from that. Something is going to happen, be produced from what you sow. The thing is, number one, is that you got to remember that you will always reap what you sow. You'll always reap what you sow. They're that source that you sow, that's what you will reap. It doesn't mean that you will only reap what you sow. You always will, but not only. Sometimes you reap what other people sow. You guys know this, there's been people in your life that have caused you some problems, right? You've kind of reaped what they sowed. They sowed some trouble, and you ended up reaping some of the consequences. Uh, there's also the flip side of that where people have sown some good things into your life and you've reaped some consequences that are good consequences from those things, some blessings, some favor. This is why it's important who you surround yourself with. Amen? amen. Every parent in this place say amen. amen. I love to remind the kids of this on Wednesday nights. It's important. Jake reminds them of this frequently. It's important who you surround yourself with because those people are sowing into your life and you're going to reap what is sown, what you may not even sow. 
Okay? Jesus tells us this when it comes to the lost. He tells us in John chapter 4 that, that we will reap where we did not labor or where we did not sow. He said, but, but the thing is that somebody else labored. Somebody else sowed and will reap the benefit from their labor, from what they have sown. So when it comes to building the kingdom, sometimes other people sow and we reap the benefits. So sometimes you reap what you did not sow, but I'll tell you what, you will always reap what you did sow. Galatians 6, 8, it says, For if you sow to your flesh, you will reap of the, fle of the flesh corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. What is your flesh? I think some people get confused sometimes and think about it. It's this body, this cursed body. I hate this body, right? This is this, this flesh. It's not really speaking of your physical body. In fact, if you don't take care of your physical body, that's sin. Like you got to take care of the temple the Lord has given you to, to live in for a while here. But, but when you think about your flesh, this is a part of your soul. This is a part of the soul that remains unredeemed. How many of you know that we, if you have faith in Christ, you have been saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved, right? right? That's justification, sanctification, glorification. That's why I'm made right by what Christ has done and receiving that in my life. Sanctification is that process of the Holy Spirit working that sin out of your life. That's the part of the flesh. Right, still warring against the spirit. Glorification is that time, hallelujah, when Jesus comes back for his church, we're all made just as he is, and we ascend to heaven with him. Praise God. Who's ready for that? I'm ready. Come, Lord Jesus, come. All right? So this natural part of us, this part of us that that has this inherit inherited sin nature, it wars against the spirit. And I love how Paul puts it in Romans chapter 7. Paul says, for I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there's no ability to do it. He says, of myself, there's nothing good in me. I may know in my mind what I need to do, but I just don't have the ability to do it on my own. This flesh, this, this part of me that is not yet fully redeemed is, is corrupt. And he says, if you sow to that, toward that, you will reap corruption or decay. In Galatians 5, verse 16, Paul again tells us, he says, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. You guys realize that's the key to the whole thing here is to walk by the Spirit. If you walk by the Spirit, guess what? The Holy Spirit will only lead you to sow to the Spirit. He'll only lead you to the things of God, the things that are good, the things that are designed and, and desired of God, of your life. The Spirit will lead you. So if you walk by the Spirit, you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the desire of the flesh is what wars against the Spirit, and the Spirit desire what the Spirit desires is what is against the flesh, right? It says these two are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. See, if you're led by the flesh, you're under the law. If you're led by the flesh, you're back to that place of is my good going to outweigh my bad? But when you're led by the Spirit, hallelujah, you're under grace and you're led back to the cross and back to the cross and back to the cross so that no, Jesus paid it all. Let's 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 move forward. Let's repent. Let's be forgiven. Let's move forward. And so Paul lays out these things. He says in verse 19, for the works of the flesh are obvious. How many of you guys know that the works of the flesh are obvious? They're usually the things that you really want to do that you know deep down inside that you shouldn't do. But you still want to do it anyway. But you know you shouldn't do it. But you want to do it anyway. Right? And, and, and it depends on where you're at in your spiritual walk. Like, whichever one you say last is the one that you're probably going to follow. I know I shouldn't do it, but I want to do it anyway. Just end with, I know I shouldn't do it. Okay? Let's skip that part. But, but he tells us that they're obvious. And he lays some out here for us. He says, uh, the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, 
idolatry, sorcery, which that word there, I want to stop on that word because the root word of that is actually pharmakia in the Greek, which would be any kind of mind-altering things like drugs, okay, hallucinogens, all those kinds of things are included in that word sorcery. It's not just witchcraft. Okay? Hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger. Somebody just walked out the door. Okay, that's me. No, stay here. Outbursts of anger, uh, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. I'm warning you about these things as I've warned you before that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who practice these things, that means it's a regular part of your life. That means it's a choice you continually make. It doesn't mean that you messed up one time and repented and you're like, well, I'm, I'm not sure because it says if I do these things. This is talking about practicing these things. When you practice for basketball, what do you do? You go to the gym on Monday and shoot free throws. You go to the gym on Tuesday and shoot three pointers. You go to the gym on Wednesday and practice layups. This is what it's talking about. If you practice these things, if it's a habit in your life, if it's a repetitive thing in your life, if it's the way you live, he says you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because you are constantly, every day, regularly sowing to the flesh, and that wreaks destruction, corruption. If you sow to the flesh and its desires, you will reap of the flesh. When you say and do what you feel, when you say and do just what you want, you will receive based on how you feel or what you want. But listen, it won't be a good return. It won't be a good reaping. It may be for a moment, but it says that it leads to death. But when you sow to the Spirit, it says that you reap of the Spirit. You read eternal life. Now, this isn't talking about salvation. It's talking about eternal life. But what's the difference? Salvation you do not receive because you sow to the Spirit. Salvation you receive because it's a free gift of God because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That he offers it to you. You have to receive it, right? You have to say, yes, I accept that, but it's not because of something you did. That's why, man, praise God, I'd love for somebody to want to get baptized, and, and we do baptism. Some of you are like, I've never seen one here. Well, I, I don't know. We, we do it sometimes. We do a lot in the pool in the summer, but uh, the thing is, baptism won't save you. You can get in there and get wet and go under and come back up and go to hell. Just like you can come and sit in these chairs and go to hell, because it's not about a thing that you do it's about what Jesus has already done and whether or not you receive that, make him Lord and Savior, and you follow him. That's salvation, that free gift. There's more to it, to eternal life, than just salvation. John 17, 3. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I can tell you, church, if you know Jesus, if you know him, you have eternal life. Do you know him? That's the question. Do you know him? Not of him. Do you know him? Right? It's, it's Lord and Savior. It's not just Savior. It's Lord. That means he's master. That means you're submitted to him. Okay? Do you know him? If you do, you have eternal life. And if you know him, then yes, you get to go to heaven one day. But the more you know him, the more you sow to the Spirit. And the more you know him... The more your life here and now is affected by eternity and for eternity. What are we sowing? Because you'll always reap what you sow. If you don't know what you're sowing, ask somebody that's close to you. Ask them. They'll tell you. If you got somebody honest with you, they'll tell you. When I'm in a mood or I'm grouchy or I'm, I'm going through a, a hard time, I can ask Christy. She'll tell me. Not, I mean, it's not in a bad way. I mean, this is a blessing. I'm telling you this. It's a, it's a blessing to have a life. That if I ask her, like, hey, here's what I'm going through, and she may point out, well, here's what, here's what you're doing. Here's the attitude you have. Like, points it out to me. I'm like, you're right. You know, I need to, need to fix that. I loved at the men's conference, uh, one of the, one of the uh, teachings was that for men, you needed somebody that would hold you accountable besides your wife. Like, 
needs to be hurt, but then you also need a guy who will punch you in the mouth if you need it. And I'm like, you know what? Guys do need that. You need a guy who will also be straight and honest with you and tell you what you need to know no matter how hard it is. Because it's true, and you need it, okay? So if you ask people in your life, they will tell you, because why? They can tell by looking at what you're producing. They can tell by looking at your life. Luke 6, 44, for every tree is known by its what? Its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. You'll always reap what you sow. The second thing is you'll always reap more than you sow. Somebody say hallelujah. That's a good thing if you're sown in the spirit. Right? It's a good thing if you're sowing in the spirit. It's not a good thing if you're sowing to the flesh. How many of you know that seeds don't produce one for one? How terrible would it be if you got a seed, tomato seed, you put it in the ground, had one little stalk with one little shoot with one little tomato? Like, that would be awful, wouldn't it? You did all that work to get one tomato, and then a rabbit came and ate half of it or something. That's, that's what would happen. It would not be worth it if a seed reproduced one for one, but they don't do that. They multiply. When you get a tomato seed, you don't get that one little plant, but you get a plant that will produce many tomatoes over and over throughout the season, okay, in different cycles. If you think about an acorn, an acorn is a seed. An acorn gets into the ground, produces an oak tree, and what does that oak tree do? produces thousands and thousands of acorns. If you have oak trees, you love them or you hate them, right? You gotta be in one camp or the other. You either love it because it's an amazing tree or you hate it because you try to walk around barefoot, those acorns hurt, you try to roll around and play with the kid in the grass, you get acorns jammed in your head, it's not very fun, okay? You either love it or hate it, but it produces thousands of acorns throughout the course of its life. And so the same goes with us with a, a small, simple word or deed in our lives can produce a massive harvest in our lives. A massive harvest. It can be good or bad. It depends on are you sowing to the flesh or sowing to the spirit. We know it produces much, much more because what Paul told us is that sowing to the flesh will reap death. Sowing to the spirit will reap life. It sounds extreme to sow to those standards, but this is what you will reap. It will be multiplied much, much more hopefully for you much, much better. One example of this, and I think I've shared this a while back, but uh, Ishmael against Isaac. Ishmael and Isaac, these two lineages that come from Abraham, one of these was so into the flesh and the other one was so into the spirit. See, God told them, you will have a son, you will have, you'll be the father of many nations, and what happens, they waited for a while. Then, they decide we're going to sow to the flesh. Take our prostitute, basically. Take our, our lady servant here. Abraham, would you lay with her and let's go ahead and get this ball rolling. Right? What God has said that he will do, uh, we're kind of tired of waiting, so let's sow to the flesh. Let's do it on our own. Let's make this thing happen to have Ishmael. Okay? Basically, trace the lineage back to the father of the Arab nations. Okay? Ishmael father of Islam. Then, a little bit later, about a year or so later, God comes and the time is right and it is here that by the faith that you believe what I said, now you sow to the spirit and you will be pregnant. You will have a child. His name is Isaac and this is the one through his lineage, right? You'll be the father of many nations. Through his lineage will come the Messiah, the Savior. These two camps, do you, you ever thought about the fact how much the Muslims hate God's people, both Jewish people and Christian people, how much hatred there is, how hard those two camps are to get in the same room and get on the same page. I'll tell you why. It's sowing to the flesh versus sowing to the spirit multiplied a billion times through generation after generation after generation to the current day. Like, that's the problem. That is the whole problem, is it's sown to the flesh or the spirit, multiplied, okay, over generations. You'll always reap more than what you sow. You think that one little mistake 
one mistake and look at all the chaos that it's caused for generations, all the way until Jesus comes back, right, for the final time, for the millennial reign. So when you think about this, you'll always sow or reap more than you sow. The last thing is you'll always reap later than you sow. You'll always reap later than you sow. And some of you are thinking, well, no kid. Like, you know, you don't just put something in the ground and, and boom, there it is. But I remember as a kid, I thought that's the way that it worked. First time I ever heard about watermelon seeds, right? If you put watermelon seeds in the ground, you can grow your own watermelons. Well, that's awesome. I'm a kid. I'm putting watermelon seeds everywhere. Like, you know, put some in the landscaping. My dad didn't, he didn't love that, but he hated it even more when I put it just out in the grass. You know, just random patches of watermelon growing all through the yard. And, and he was a good dad, and I remember he mowed around a couple of those, okay? But, but I thought about these watermelon seeds, and when I first heard about it, that it would grow in the ground, I was a little bit skeptical. And I'm thinking, my mom goes to the store and buys this thing. Like, what do you mean if you put the seeds in the ground, I'm going to get more watermelons? And I, you know, so I was skeptical. And I don't know if they didn't have them back then, or, or you know, we just didn't get them, but we didn't ever have those seedless watermelons. We always had the ones with the seeds in them. There was always a lot of seeds in them, too, it seemed like. And I started to think about how many seeds that I had eaten. I began to become a believer. These seeds, they're going to grow into something. And they're inside of me. And this does not seem like it's going to be a good end result. So now I'm a little bit of a believer, and I'm like, well, I guess I might as well go plant some in the yard. I'm going to try this out. I'm going to see what happens. And I remember putting those seeds in the ground, and I remember going out the next day. You know what it looked like? Nothing. Same. Go out the next day. What did it look like? Same as the day before. I mean, this went on for day after day after day. Next day, the same as the last, nothing. Then all of a sudden, I see this little plant. And I'm like, all right, now we're cooking. Right now that that plant has popped up, I'm going to have watermelons like by 3 o'clock. You know, that's what I'm thinking as a kid. I go out and I check. The next day, it's it's still small. The next day, it's small. Somewhere it got to like medium, you know, where it's like small, medium. And then it finally got to medium, and then it finally got to large, and then it started to, you know, produce little watermelons. And I'm thinking, man, one of these days, like when I have grandkids, I'm going to be able to eat one of these watermelons, because this process is taking forever. It's, it's so bad, but, I, but, you know, eventually there were watermelons that were big enough, ripe, ready to eat. I had to wait so long that I thought there was no way this is ever going to work. There's no way that the watermelons we get in the store that somebody did this. That's what I'm thinking. Nobody is that crazy to wait that long to get this watermelon. That's really what I thought. It was a long process. When I would go out and check it, it never looked like I thought it should look. It never progressed as fast as I thought it should progress. And this is the same for when we sow, whether it's to the flesh or to the spirit. You'll always reap later than what you sow. See, a lot of people live like hell Monday or you know Monday through Saturday. A lot of people are at the bar getting drunk last night, and then they're doing whatever they can all week long. And what happens is they live like this all week long, and they come to church on Sunday morning. What they're doing, without knowing it, is they're praying for a crop failure. They're praying that what they sowed all week long, Lord, I'm sorry, right? Forgive me, I'm going to do it again as soon as I get home today, but, but I'm praying that what I did last week will die off, that it will be a crop failure, that I won't receive anything from that. But the Bible says that if you plant poor choices, that you will reap bad consequences. It doesn't say that you might, it says that you will. At some point, it will happen. It's an irrefutable law. And so when Paul says in this verse, he says, starts it off by saying, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. Remember, turning your nose up at God. If we try to live this life of sin and we try to just turn our nose up at God and think, I've got away with it. Things are working out for me. I got a secret for you. It's just not harvest time yet. It's just not harvest time. What goes around will come around because in this instance, it's a spiritual law. If we've sung to the spirit, though, Church, I want to tell you, if you sow to the Spirit, do not get discouraged. He told us in Galatians 6, 9, and let us not grow weary while doing good. 
Don't grow weary while doing good. I know that we do things that sometimes you don't see the fruit of. You don't see a result. You don't see things moving. It's like going out to check on that watermelon. You're like, I've been doing this, but it looks the same as it did yesterday. Is this even worth it? Right? Is it even worth my time? Yes, it is. He says, if we don't grow weary, he says, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as you have an opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are in the household of faith. Listen, you always reap later than what you sow. Sometimes it's, it's a long way. Sometimes it's, there's, there's nothing changing. Nothing's looking better, looking different, but you've got to keep sowing to the Spirit and not grow weary. So in that due season, when it comes, you'll reap if you do not lose heart. Church, karma is a lie. Karma is a lie. Karma is spiritual plagiarism of the law of sowing and reaping. And the problem is that when, if you get to this place where you have to keep score, here, here's what I've seen happen. When, when me and Jake are doing something with the high school group, we both kind of caught on to this. If we're doing something where they can see the score, right? If we got the scoreboard on a whiteboard or something, and, and you guys, we split them down the middle. So let's say you guys are down two, and there's two rounds to go. You're still fully in it. Okay, then these guys get a turn and they they get another one right. Now you're down three with two rounds to go. What happens? They're like, what's the point? Like we've already lost. No matter what we do, we cannot do enough to even tie, to even balance it, let alone to overcome and to win. It's hard to keep going when you get in that place. And it's the same way if you're trying to let your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds in life. Listen, it's going to be too easy to give up. It's going to be too easy to say that it doesn't matter because you'll never be able to catch up. You'll never be able to catch up. And I don't want anybody here to get to the end of your life and to stand before the Lord and have the hope that maybe, just maybe I squeaked it out. Just maybe I ended up with that one more good thing. Maybe, hopefully... I wonder if I was good enough. Because I want to tell you this morning that you haven't. You haven't been good enough. I haven't been good enough. There's none of us that have been good enough, which is why we need a Savior. And his name is Jesus. Amen? That's why we need him. Because we have not been good enough. You cannot do more good than what you've done bad. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, right? Hallelujah for his righteousness. Will you stand with me this morning? I had this thought that if I think about weird things sometimes and I thought, what if I was told that I got two weeks to live? Like how would I live my life different if somebody said, listen, Tim, you're dying, you have two weeks to live. What are the things that I would do different in my life? How would my speech change? The things that I say, how would my actions change? The things that I do, that I spend my time on? And, and I, I thought to myself, you might only have two weeks to live. You might only have two days to live. You might only have two minutes to live because there's not one of us that's promised tomorrow. Not a single one of us. We don't know when that day, when that time will come. And so why aren't we living like that now? This is something that God showed me about my own life. Why aren't you just living like that now? Like this could be your last breath. Like this could be your last day. Because I'll tell you what, your tomorrow, if you have one, will be the result of the choices that you make today. Right? The result of the choices that you made today. We've got to be careful what we're sowing, church. We've got to be careful what we're investing in, what we're putting our mouth, our words into, what we're putting our actions into. And if we're sowing to please our sinful nature, we've got to repent. We've got to repent. 
Lord, forgive me. I, I change my mind, turn my mind around, turn my life around. Send me the other way. Church, if you're sowing in the spirit, we've got to repeat it and keep on repeating and keep on repeating and don't get tired and don't get weary. Don't lose heart. Just keep believing, keep believing, keep pushing forward, knowing that God is in it. That in due season, one way or the other, we're going to reap that harvest. Would you bow with me? The Father, I thank you and praise you for your word. God, I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you that today, Lord, that as we look at this law of sowing and reaping, that God, it's not just a promise, but it is something that will happen. It's, it, it truly is. And if then, that if we sow to the flesh, that we will reap that corruption. But Lord, if we sow to the spirit, that we will reap everlasting life. And so, Father, I just pray for this place, these people, in our presence right here, those online. Holy Spirit, would you speak to our hearts? Would you begin to reveal to us the true standing where we're really at? Lord, you know the deepest, darkest desires of our heart. Lord, you know that stuff even better than we do. And so, Lord, we just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would bring conviction upon your people today. Lord, because the conviction of the Spirit of the living God is for our good. It is for our good so that you can begin to work that stuff out of our lives, that you bring it to our attention. It's that, that pruning it, growing out and cutting it off so that something better and greater can come of it. Lord, I pray that for those that are without you today, that this would become a true reality to us of where we are without you, Jesus. How desperately we need you. How good you are. How great your love is for us. Lord, that you poured out your life on that cross. So today for the unbeliever, for those who have gone astray, Lord, I pray that today would be the day that you would call them back to you. Holy Spirit, would you lead them to the cross? Lord, we thank you and praise you. We thank you and praise you for who you are, for your presence in this place. Will you have your way with us as we worship you, as we praise you because you are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen.